one. Okay. We're going to go back to the original issue discount. And I'm going to go over where all this stems from. This all stems from HJR 192. And here's the phrase, shall be discharged upon payment dollar for dollar in any coin or currency which at the time of payment is legal tender for all public and private debts. What was legal tender for all debts, public and private, in 1933? Gold was. The government confiscated all your gold. They sent it to China. So they had to give you that with payment or discharge upon presentment. They discharged all of your debt. Future. This is future. You can't take somebody's money away and not give them compensation. So they compensated you by prepaying all of your debt. Dollar for dollar. In 19, this has been going on since 1933. And nobody understands it. Because they keep trying to pay debts that are prepaid. Because people don't understand the OID process. So I'm going to go over this, and I keep going over this, because this is at the crux of everybody's problem. I don't care if you're in a criminal case, you're in a civil case, it's a tax case. And if you don't understand what a tax is, you don't understand what's going on. Everybody I talk to says, oh yeah, I understand what a tax is, and I start asking them questions and they can't answer. That means they don't understand what taxes are. It's not a tax until... You do an assessment. You have to assess the tax. Why do you have to assess the tax? Because you own the credit that the government chooses. You are the owner of the credit. You are the creditor in fact. That's why the government, every time they use your credit, has to give you an OID identifying you as the payor and themselves as the recipient of the funds. Everybody understand that? You can't get much simpler than that. Go read the OID. Go read the OID. Publication. Go read Publication 1212. I haven't met one person in the Patriot community that's ever read Publication 1212. I'm going to take you in there and explain it to you so that everybody can understand it. You've got to understand that you, if your law, everybody's looking for a remedy. You can't get a remedy until you understand what's going on. That's why God invented me. I'm going to explain to you. I've been studying this stuff for 50 years. And I'm going to prove to you right now what's going on. And then I'm going to document it. We're going to go down to page 6. Go to page 6. Nobody re has read this publication. Nobody. N-O-B-O-D-Y. Nobody reads this publication. This tells you what is going on. There's one paragraph in this document that gives you the whole key to the whole redemption process. And I'm going to show you what it is. And nobody knows this even exists. Go down to the bottom of page 6. Go down to the bottom. Uh, that's page 6. Well, yeah, let's see. Maybe it's... Let's see. I thought it was page 6. Yeah, here it is. Okay. Download publication 1212 off the IRS website. Follow along with me and you'll learn what's going on. Nominee. This is what's going on. What are they doing? <laughs> They're doing a nominee for the true owner, which is you. If you are the holder of an OID, original issue discount debt instrument, and you receive a form 1099 OID, that shows your taxpayer identification number and, and, and includes amounts belonging to another person, you are considered a nominee. Well, what are those amounts belonging to another person? That's the amount of the bills that all of these corporations are sending you every month 
for the use of your credit. And they're reporting it on a, on a tax statement. They're using your credit. And they're doing it as a nominee for you because they're using your credit. You must file another form 1099 OID for each actual owner. You are the owner. You are the payor on the 1099 OID because they're using your credit. And they send you a bill to notice you that that's the amount of your credit that they are using. Now, that doesn't become a tax until you assess it. And the way that you assess it is you have to file a 1040 tax form and a 1099 OID and a 1096 and a 1040B. And you do it. Pay to the order of. Who do you pay it to? You pay it to the Department, U.S. Department of Treasury. Why? Because the U.S. Department of Treasury is handling the bookkeeping. And unless you report it as a return or a tax, they can't do the bookkeeping on it. That's why the Treasury's books are all screwed up. Their payables and their receivables are out of balance. Payables are what they owe to you. And they can't pay you because you haven't filed the proper paperwork to get the refund on the credit that you're giving away to everybody. You can't get much simpler than that. So after three years, somebody else in grab, comes in and grabs that. Yeah, so what they're doing, because it's abandoned property, because you never claimed it, so they do it. They do this nominee. They do it in your name. And they use your taxpayer identification number. And they do a 1099-A showing it as abandoned property because you never claimed it. It's like taking a $100,000 suitcase full of $100,000 bills and throwing it down on the sidewalk. Whoever claims it, owns it. If you think this is what's going on, you're going to be in for a rude awakening. This is exactly what they're doing. If you are a holder of an OID instrument that shows your taxpayer, that's why you ask them for your their taxpayer identification number. Because that way you can identify them as the recipient of the funds. You can't do that until you get their, their taxpayer identification number. that shows your taxpayer identification number and includes amounts belonging to another person. You are considered a nominee. Well, what are the amounts belonging to another person? That's the amount of the credit that they're using. That's the amount of the credit, and that's represented by the tax. By you assessing the tax, when you assess the tax, it becomes a return or a tax issue, issue or a tax matter. Now, if, the I, if you show them as the recipient of the funds, then the, the IRS can issue you a refund. But this is what they're doing. And if you don't do this, then you've abandoned the funds. So they give them away to somebody else. If you think this isn't what's going on, ask any. I've talked to Alvin Brown. I've talked to Alexander Bow. I've talked to Phil Lilly, who are two of the top class five gift and estate tax attorneys in the United States. And they said, I am 100% correct. So this is not even open to debate. You have to get with what is going on. If you don't understand it, if there's something you don't understand, ask questions. This is how you learn. You're going through a learning process. I'm learning. You're going, if you don't understand something, you ask questions. So what I'm doing is explaining to you what is going on. This is what's going on. Complete form 1099 OID and form 1096 and fill the Forms with the, file the forms with the Internal Revenue 
center for your area. You must also give a copy of the Form 1099 OID to the actual owner. However, you are not required to file a nominee return to show a mouse belonging to your spouse. When we're preparing your tax return, follow the instructions under showing an OID adjustment the next session. So they're doing it as a nominee for the true owner. Those amounts that they're showing are amounts belonging to somebody else. So they're doing it as a nominee. And that somebody else is you. You. Y O U. You got to change the way you're thinking. You're acting if if you accept somebody's bill as a debt owed by you, you're acting as a debtor because your actions speak what you are. You're acting like a debtor. You're not acting as a creditor. You're acting as a debtor. You go in there and argue facts. You're a debtor. You go in there and argue the law in court. I don't care if you're doing it at the administrative level or if you're doing it in the court. You're arguing facts, you're arguing law. I've been doing this for 50 years. The only time I ever got a win is when I started addressing the tax issue. I made them liable for all the taxes, I identified them as the recipient of the funds, they dismissed the case. It's, I did this on a mortgage case. And, it, and the, the appellate court said that they didn't have standing to foreclose on the property because I made a, a tax issue out of it. If they had ruled differently, I would have filed a 1099 OID showing them as the recipient of the funds. Because the court foreclosed on my property, not the bank. The bank doesn't own anything. Who's the true owner? You are. Who gave them the funds? You did. You just didn't report it. You abandoned it. So they filed a 1099A and they claimed it. And that's what the courts adjudicate. Abandonment of property. You abandon the property at closing. And, and that's what the court's addressing, the abandonment, purposeful relinquishment of title and ownership in the property. What property? The deed of trust. What's in the deed of trust? Real estate. What's also in the deed of trust? Real estate. Promissory note. You abandon the promissory note, you abandon the deed of trust. So somebody else claimed it because you abandoned it. Whose fault is that? You. Y O U. Look in the mirror. If you want to know who the enemy is, look in the mirror. Quit attacking these people. You start doing stuff right, you start listening to what I'm telling you, and start doing things right, you'll get a remedy. Instead of attacking these people, you're just, the American people are doing everything wrong. They're doing everything right, and you're doing everything wrong. Are they being honest with you? No. But you have a responsibility. You have the responsibility. Don't let, don't lay it on them. You have 100% responsibility to do this. They don't. You have to. Why? Because you own the credit. They're using your credit. And if you're too lazy to do it, then don't complain about when you run out of money and you're sitting off in a field somewhere wondering what struck you. Then you're going to start doing something. You're going to start thinking about what. Don't wait till it gets there. Assume responsibility. This is all about sovereignty. If you're going to be sovereign and claim to be a secured party creditor, start acting like one. And quit playing the role of the debtor. Quit going in there and arguing with the judge about facts and law. Go in there and address the tax issue. Tell them you're there on a tax issue. These requirements, go read publication 1099A and 1099C. The court has to file a 1099 OID. It says that in the 1099 instruction book, 1099A and 1099C instruction book. I can go over there and show you. It's on page two, part five. Courts have to file a 1099. Why? Because they're using your credit. They have to do it. But they're not going to do it unless you make them do it. Make them address the, t the issue, the tax issue. I've got a bunch of people who are involved in criminal cases. It's a tax case. 
It's not a criminal case. It's a tax issue. There's no charge on the indictment. You won't find one criminal case where the grand jury is indicted anybody. Why? Because there's no charge on the indictment. What does it do to take to put a charge on an indictment? There has to be a creditor because it's all commercial. A debtor, all of these people in the public domain are debtors in possession under a Chapter 11 reorganization. They're all debtors. A L L. Not some of them, all of them. So they're acting as debtors. So nobody can charge an indictment because what they're doing is sending you a tax bill. You're in a tax court and the judge is acting as, a, as an agent for the IRS to, to collect taxes. And he's testing you to see if you know what you're, what you're doing. And almost everybody flunks as they go in there. I've done it myself. They go in there and they start arguing the law and they start arguing facts. The facts are on the move. The judge knows what's going on. Started addressing the tax issue and watch what happens. Tom, you want him to file a 1099 OID and identify who the payor is and who the recipient of the funds is. So that he, he can verify his claim in fact, which is what the indictment is. It's, it's a claim. They're bringing a claim, but it's not in, in fact because there's been no 1099. Ask him to file the 1099 OID to prove up his claim. He can't do it. Why? Because he's a debtor. Only the creditor can file a 1099 OID, not a debtor. That's why he can't prove his claim. How can they be, how can they be coming after you for money when they're a debtor? This whole thing is ludicrous. You can't, people end up in bankruptcy court because they're, they're, they're playing the role of the debtor. They liquidate all your property because you're acting like a debtor instead of a creditor. You should never be in bankruptcy court, ever. Is there anybody that doesn't understand this? They're acting as a nominee for who? The true owner, which is you. Y-O-U. And I'm not talking about a female she. I'm not talking about an E-W-E. I'm talking about a Y-O-U. Toby knows what I'm talking about. <laughs> what a U is. <laughs> They're acting as a nominee for you. Because, why? Because you're asleep. The American people have gone to sleep. If they don't wake up, they're going to wake up in dead land, which is debt land. I'm teaching this so we can say this is what true salvation is. This is what redemption is. Isn't redemption salvation? Well, this is how you get redemption. This is what true redemption is. And it's all a tax issue. And before this night is over, you're going to understand it. Anybody got any questions? You guys understand? <laughs> Are you trying to wake me up? Okay, so now we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna go out of here. This is what's going on. You need to get this and read it. Now we're gonna go down to go back to my folder. Thumb drive. Go down to where it says, go find a folder that says 1099 OIG. Go up here. Folder? Yeah, that one right there. Click on that. Okay. Scroll down.
go back out. Okay, go to go to this one here and your OID. Okay, uh, click on this. This one. Okay, go uh, now. Okay, this this came out of volume 33A of Amjur the Second, section 12400. Original issue discount, OID as taxable interest. This is in volume 33 of Andrew II, section 12400. The holder of a debt instrument issued with original issue discount must include part of the OID in income each year he holds the instrument. Okay, what does that say? Does that say public debt instrument? No. No. Anybody says the holder of a debt instrument. If you give somebody a check, are they holding a debt instrument? Yes. Yes. The fact that they're billing you for a debt means that they're holding the instrument. So they need to report it. Yeah, they're supposed to do. They're supposed to get what they're what they're doing is I'm not making, you're reading this yourself. This is the law. I'm showing you the law regarding taxes. These are regulations. These are what these people go by. And you need to understand the regulations before you get out there and start doing 1099 OIDs, 1096s. Everybody wants to get out there and start filing paperwork and they don't even know what the hell they're doing. That's why you're ending up in trouble if you don't know what you're doing. That's why I'm doing these classes. The holder of a debt instrument. What is a debt instrument? 1273 tells you what a debt instrument is. Any, all, everything. Commercial paper, checks. I got news for you. The banks are taking your checks and they're OIDing them. They're <laughs> using the checks to buy securities. They're investing those checks as original issue discount. Remember 3-105 says the issuer of the first funds transfer of buy an instrument. 3-105, A and C. You are the, that is the issue. This is the issue. That's the issue that they're talking about in the OID. And nobody, nobody is doing this. Not one person in the whole Patriot community is doing this. You should be OIDing everything, every check you write, every debt. They're all debt instruments. What does that say? The holder of a debt instrument issued with original issue discount must include part of the OID in, in, in income each year he holds the instrument. They send you a bill. The gas company, the electric company, the water company, the electrical company, they're telling you in the bill how much of your credit they're using, they're holding. And what do you do? Like a dummy, you send them a check. What are you doing? You're giving them a debt instrument. Now they've got two debts. They're using your credit, plus you give them another debt instrument which they have to report as income. Now whose income is it? It's yours. And then after three years they claim the payment coupon that you don't yeah. use? Yeah. Then the coupon, the, the coupon and the voucher that they send with your bill that you didn't use and abandon, they use it. <laughs> Every bill you get from a utility company, I don't care if it's a gas bill, I don't care if it's a water bill, I don't care if it's an electrical bill, I don't care what kind of bill it is. They have a coupon attached to it. That coupon is the prepayment which you should use to pay, to show that it's prepaid under HJR 192. But you've abandoned that. You send them a check. They take your check and they spend it. They don't use it to pay the bill. The, the bill's already been paid. When? 1933. HJR 192. 
and they ask you to include it in the mail and you send it back with your check so they can get it back. Yeah, then they file a tax return and get, get the refund that you should be claiming. Jesus. <laughs> and you what's wrong with this country? If you want to know who, who the enemy is, go look in the mirror. Now go to now let's go to 124. That doesn't say anything about public issue debt instruments, did it? No. It says debt instrument, isn't it? No. Okay. I'm showing you the law, and I can take you into the IRS code and show you the same thing. Title 26, section 1273, 274. Original issue discount OID is taxable interest. Why is it taxable? Because they're using your credit. Your, it's evidence of indebtedness. Go read section 61. Of title 26? Yeah. You want to go over there? And go, I'll show you what's includable in gross income. Go to title 26, section 61. It's in my, uh, it's on that uh, thumb drive. Everything is on that, on that thing. On that uh, title 26. Go to section 61. Okay, here's gross income defined. Section 61, title 26. Gross income derived from business is income. Interest is income. Scroll down. Go to 12. Income from discharge of indebtedness. Number 12. All of this stuff is, is, is because it represents credit that they're using income from an interest in an estate or trust. Number 15 comes. What is the trust? The all capital letter name. It's an estate or trust. That's where all the, that's where the uh, credit's coming from. Number 14, income in respect of a decedent. That all capital letter name is a decedent. Any questions? If I give you a test, everybody can pass the test, right? Right. <laughs> the holder of a debt instrument. Does that say anything about public debt instrument? No, it doesn't. It says a debt instrument. Duh. Everything is a debt instrument because there's no money. Corporations and municipal corporations, municipalities, state, federal, I don't care what it is. They all deal in commercial debt. That's why they operate under the Uniform Commercial Code. Because the Uniform Commercial Code deals in debt instruments, which are called negotiable instruments. The holder of a Concurrent inclusion of original issue discount as interest income. The holder of a debt instrument specified at 12407 that is issued with the original issue discount, C 124A, must include, must is mandatory, include a portion of that OID in income as interest. In each year, he holds the debt instrument. Even though the OID isn't paid until maturity, a cash basis holder can't defer inclusion of the OID until it's actually paid. What does that say? Can't defer inclusion. That means you have to, if you're the holder of a debt instrument, is that what these people are doing? No, they're not doing that. And neither are you. They're using your debt instrument, which is called credit. 
and you're not reporting it to the IRS, so there's no tax due because you haven't assessed it. You have to assess it by filing a 1099 OID and a 1096. And a 1040B, which is a payment bucket. You pay the IRS, the IRS collects it back from the from person that's using your credit. This is how it works. They're bookkeepers. They can't keep track of your books unless you're reporting it. You're not reporting it, so you're a tax user. That's why all these people are in criminal cases. For how to determine the amount of currently includable OID, see 12437XC. For exception to these rules, for certain holders, see 12403. Are there any questions? I know everybody understands this. I'm going to give you a test at the end of the class. We'll see who classes it. Okay, go to the 12402. Go to, go to the next next topic. 12402. I've read all of these sections, 50 sections in Andrew. I've read them all. One twenty-four oh two says application of anti-abuse rule. If a principal purpose is structuring a debt instrument or engaging in a transaction is to achieve a result that's unreasonable in light of the purposes of the OID rules under 163. This is prepayment of interest, which is tax deductible, and this is 1271, which goes into original issue discount through IRC 1275. These are all debt, public debt instruments. And anything that uh, evidence Anything that evidences evidences indebtedness. Everything that you create evidence indebted, indebtedness because it's owed back to you because they are all bankrupt. Got that? They went into a Chapter 11 reorganization and they're all acting as debtors in possession, acting as trustees to the bankrupt estate. If everybody understands this, then how come people are not doing this? How come nobody in the, in the patriot community is teaching this? What are they doing? Isn't this what they, aren't they abusing the rule? Aren't they engaging in a transaction to achieve a result that's unreasonable in light of the purposes of the OID rules? They're trying to steal your credit and not pay for it. They're not paying you back. You're not getting paid back, but the reason you're not getting paid back is because you're not you're not assessing the tax and making them pay you back. So whose fault is it? You. Why owe you? That's called the anti-abuse rule. What they're doing is abusing you because you're letting them. It's like if you let somebody beat you up. It's your fault. A result is unreasonable if the transaction is structured to create an artificial tax law significantly in excess of any reasonably expected economical law. A tax buyer buys two notes with offsetting interest rate resets. One, one expected to increase significantly, the others to decrease significantly, and latter claims a loss on sale of the note that decreased in value. Go down. The anti-abuse rule didn't apply to a convertible contingent debt instrument an instrument convertible into the issuer's stock and calling for one or more contingent cash payments. 
for debt instruments issued after August 13, 96, number 7, the above rules didn't apply. Instead, in circumstances specified in the regs, IRS could apply or depart from the regs as necessary or appropriate to, to achieve a reasonable result. If you're, these rules don't apply to transactions which occurred before 94 or 96. Okay, go to, to 124.03. You know what we ought to do is put these on a, on a disc and make them available to these guys so they can, because they don't have access to this stuff. <coughs> okay. To charge them, uh, uh, you know, $25 piece or then twenty eight. So I have to buy these tapes, these tapes where they, where these tapes cost? They're like seven bucks a piece. Seven bucks a piece. Tapes are. It took me about two hours to download all this stuff. I went through here and read all this stuff. I downloaded every section in Andrew that deals with OID. Do you think I know I know what OIDs are? Holders. This is section 12403, volume 33 of Andrew the Second on federal taxation. And it's covering original issue discount as taxable interest. Hold, hold, holders, you know what a holder is. A person, a holder is a person who's in possession and control of a debt instrument. That's what a holder is. And it's defined in 3 302 and what is it, 3 302? The holder in due course, 301 and 302. 301 and 302. 302 is a holder in due course, and 301 is a holder. They have to have possession. And what these people do is they sell your credit. They sell your credit as a publicly traded debt instrument because you won't assume responsibility. All of this, these problems that we're, and I'm not bad-mouthing people, I'm just telling you what's going on. All the problems that you're experiencing economically can be traced to the American people. You've got to start assuming responsibility. If you want to be a, a secured party creditor, start acting like one. If you're not doing this, you're not a secured party creditor, you're a secured party debtor. Which is why you're getting raped. Older accepted from the OID current inclusion rule. What's inclusion mean? They have to include it as income on, on their OID. The current inclusion of OID rules does not apply to holders of debt instrument issued before 85. So that doesn't apply to us because we're in, two, as you can count, we're in 2010. We're not in 1985. So if they're holding a debt instrument, we're back in 1985. See, the reason they're telling you that is because this is all all 1099 OIDs, all 1099. A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, N, O, P, Q, R, S, T. All 1099s, 1098s, 1096 are Class 5 gift and estate taxes. And it says that in the IRS processing manual. Go to the IRS website and download it and read it. And you'll find out exactly what I'm saying. There is no statute of limitations on a Class 5 gift and estate tax. You can go back as far as there is 1099. There's no... I, Alvin Brown told me this. This is another thing I ask you. You want to know who Alvin Brown is? The chief prosecutor for the CID division of the Internal Revenue Service. He has his own tax practice now. I call him up all the time and talk to him. There is no statute of limitations on Class 5 gift and estate tax. If you're using a 1040 income tax return, there's a three-year statute of limitations. 
you can only go back three years. If you file it as a class five gift and a state tax, you can go back as far as there's 1099. There's no stamp that won't pay. You can go back 30 years. A holder who buys the debt instrument at a premium, i.e., a price that exceeds the instrument's state of redemption price of maturity, a holder whose basis in the debt instrument is determined by reference to its basis in the hands of a person who bought it at a premium. They're buying your debt instrument because you're not claiming them, because you abandoned them. Do you still think that, that stupidity is a virtue? You cannot abandon responsibility. You have to, you're suffering the consequences. This is what's wrong with this country. What I'm explaining to you today is what's wrong with this whole economy. It's what's wrong with the government because the people are not assuming any responsibility. So we claim them by filing OADs every month? Or every quarter? Well, you do a year like Whenever you're, you're April 15th, you file an OID on all of this, all these debt instruments that you accumulated during the 12 month period. You, 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 you file on this when the, uh, but see, you're, what everybody's doing is they're doing it. Uh, are OIDs required to file, file be filed yearly, or they or they be filed quarterly? Be filed quarterly. I think that 8281 says if it's on the public debt instrument list, it needs to be filed every month. If it's 30, if 30 days after the issue of the of the uh, instrument. Well, you have to report. You have to report it on the 8281. Yeah, you report it on the 8281. A holder whose basis in the debt instrument is determined by reference, they're not the holder. They're selling these, these things. Just like they're doing on these mortgages. None of these people, these servicing companies, that are doing these mortgages are the lender. They're not the holder. They're not the lender. They've got no business going into court. And the reason they're going into court is because you didn't claim the tax. You did not assess the tax. It's a tax issue. You're in there beating your head, arguing this fact, this law, this fact, but you're out of this, and the judge just ignores everything you say. Doesn't that what they do? I went through 10 years of this. I've got, I've got truck, I could fill up a Mayflower van with, with, the, with the paperwork I'm filing for, and the judge just wipes their tush on it. Uses a toilet paper. They're probably laughing every time they go to the bank. <laughs> because nobody's doing anything right. <laughs> but we're going to change all that, right? Right. A holder whose basis in the debt instrument, notice it says debt, the debt instrument. It doesn't say publicly traded debt instrument or original issue discount. It is an original issue discount. What this tells me is that all debt instruments are original issue discounts. All. A-L-L. -L. Show me where I'm wrong. That's all you deal in is debt. You don't deal in there. There is no money. Everything that you call checks, money orders, cashier's checks, Letters of credit are all what? Evidence of indebtedness. And what does it say in 61? All evidence of, it, of indebtedness is includable in gross income. Is that what you're doing? No. You're not doing it right. That's why, you're, that's why they're raping you. They're taking all your credit and using it they're going to love me for this. They're, they're using your credit and not paying you for it because you don't want to assume the responsibility. But don't complain about this. When you run out of money and you wonder why and this nation collapses and nobody can, has any money because they can't buy anything, because they can't buy food, and you're sitting off in the field wondering what struck you, don't complain about it. Remember what I told you.
responsibility. People are complaining about what the government does. You ought to be complaining about what you're doing. Forget the government. They're not responsible for this. You are. You are responsible, not the government. Go to Romans 13. Romans 13. Verse 24. This goes clear up to 124.52. <laughs> I've read every one of these. This is what I do all week long while everybody's sitting around uh, working. <laughs> everybody's working. I'm re reading this stuff. Somebody's got to do this, so I do it. This is what I do. I do this stuff almost like 24-7. A debt instrument is defined. Notice what that says. Debt instrument defined. Okay? You getting this? Mm -hmm. Huh? I'm just reading this. Wow. Wow. What does this say? Now this is in, if you if you click on this, it will take you to 1273 and 1275 of Title 26, which defines what a debt instrument is. And what does this say? For OID purposes, a debt instrument is a... Notice it doesn't say public debt instrument, does it? No. So they're putting, they probably put that in 1212 to throw off these patriot types that are trying to do this, the 16 million people doing OID every year. And the IRS is probably turning a lot of this stuff down just to see if you know what the, the, <laughs> the FCK you're doing. <laughs> they're, they're testing you. Do, do, do they test you to see if you know what you're talking about? Sure they do. Let me ask you something. The IRS has a DUNS number. What does that tell you? They're a privately owned trading company running your bookkeeping. Do you think they know what they're doing? Yes, they know what they're doing. They want to see if you know what you're doing. And you're not going to know what you're doing until you start studying this stuff. And you have to assume the responsibility. Just like I'm doing. I'm taking the responsibility to teach this to you, so that you'll understand it. For OID purposes, a debt instrument is a bond, a debenture, a note, or certificate, or other, what's or other evidence of indebtedness. Huh? Go click on, on 15. Click on that. Go, go, go to 1275. It's coming up. Go, go to, type in uh, 1275. Now, this is in Title 26. Other definitions. Debt instrument. This is where that came from. This is Section 1275. Title 26. You got to read a letter. I wrote, wrote this to a judge. <laughs> that is the assessment. Paid to the order of. I asked him for a TIN number because I had their Dunn's number. I called up the Dunn and Bradstreet and got the United States District Court for the Santa Ana Division. I got their Dunn's number. <laughs> they're publicly, they're a, they're, these are all publicly, public uh, trade companies, privately owned trade companies. Operating, they're private, but they're operating in the public domain, and they're stealing all your credit. They're not stealing it; you're giving it to them, and you wonder why you don't have any money. You can stop. You can quit wondering. Except as provided. This is again for for your edification. Title 26, section 1275, debt instrument. Except as provided in subparagraph B, the term debt instrument means a bond, debenture, note, or certificate, or other evidence of indebtedness. You notice they never, what, 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 what other evidence of indebtedness? Isn't everything a debt instrument? You show me something that's not a debt instrument. 
That's, that's currently being used as money, what you call money. It's a debt instrument. That's why it's all includable in gross income. Go ask the IRS if I know what I'm talking about. You don't have to. I call them up all the time and talk to them. They, they refer me to the special issues kind of. This is other evidence of indebtedness, doesn't that? include everything? Everything that you use as money is includable in gross income and you're not doing it. A debt instrument doesn't include any annuity contract. Depends on whole or substantially in part on the life expense of one or more individuals. Is issued by an insurance company. That's why a lot of these courts, these judges, are doing annuity contracts. And they're doing 801Ks, which is an offshore retirement fund. That's where all this money that, they, that you've abandoned, they put it in an 801K offshore, and you're funding their retirement fund because you don't want any responsibility. I'm just making you aware. What you do with this is your business. This is your responsibility. So I'm just making you aware of it. Now you have. You either do it or you don't. I think a question would be how exactly do we do it? We file our 1099s. We file our taxes on what? A 709 instead of a 1040. Well, if you're going to include, this is all. These are all debt instruments, so they're includable, includable as income. Now, if you receive something from, a, if you're the re recipient of funds from somebody else, then you would use the, uh, you wouldn't report it as income. Because you're going to have to pay the tax on it if you report it as income. Can you repeat that? Yeah, I'm a little confused. Okay, debt instruments are included in income. Any evidence of indebtedness is income under a section, under under uh, income tax law. So the holder of the evidence is in, is, has received income. Well, yeah, but whose income has he received? Yours. Who did it income from? Where did he get it from? He got it from you, didn't he? If I write you a check, it, 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 uh, did the income come from me? Can I report that as income? You want to report that as income? Because you're going to get hammered on taxes for it, aren't you? Not if you uh, include it on an OID. If you do a 1096 and a 1099 OID and an 8281, and report it as taxable income, you get you get you get a refund. Do a 1040B. You do a pay to the order of. You gotta do a pay to the order of. You write it on the bill, pay to the order of the US Department of Treasury. Charge some said to the person who sent you the bill. People are not doing that. That's why they're not getting the set off. The IRS is turning around and billing you for it because you paid it to them. Now they're, they're sending you the bill for the tax. That's why you've got to file the OID showing the recipient of the fund. The person who received your fund. The person who's using your credit. We've got to change the tape. We've got to change the tape. We'll be right back. So stay tuned.
Okay, this is, we're back to the HDR 192. It shall be discharged upon payment. When you do pay to the order of United States Department of the Treasury, charge some said, and you put the person's name who sent you the bill on there. That's a discharge upon payment dollar for dollar in any coin or currency which at the time of payment is legal tender for public and private debt. If you go to 1 201, it says the definition of money is not limited to what is legal tender. Money is 1813L1 of Title 12 says a promissory note deposited in a demand deposit account is the equivalent of money or cash. So does statement of cash flow. You want to go on there and look, look, look at the statement of cash flow number 95? We can, we can, we did that on previous class. I'm going to show you guys something. Go to FASB. Type in FASB. Click on there. Go to EITF. Right here. Okay. Yeah, uh, go, go back up. You, 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 have to, you gotta get over here on the left. Bring the left over. Uh, and here, abstract. Go to abstract. Full text abstract. Right here. Okay. County standards certification. Now I've got a statement of cash flow of 95. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh. You're, you're down to 168. Go to 95. Right here. Add amended? Right here. Scroll down. You can't see it. Yeah, that's a measure. Just click on that. Except. You guys can download all this stuff and read it. Go to page 63. I only have 52 pages. Well, you're in, you're in a long one. Go back out. Go as, as issued. As issued. Yeah. Okay, and this is FASB, number 95, Statement of Cash Flow. Consistent with common usage, cash includes not only currency on hand, but demand deposit, deposits with banks or other financial institutions. Cash also includes other kinds of accounts that have the general characteristics of demand deposits in that the customer may deposit additional funds at any time and also effectively may withdraw funds at any time without prior notice of penalty. All charges and credits to those accounts are cash receipts or payments to both the entity owning the account and the bank holding it. For example, a bank's granting of a loan by credit by credit by crediting the proceeds to a customer's demand deposit account is a cash payment by the bank and a cash receipt of the customer when entry is made. Ask the ask the ask the bank where the cash receipt is. If you take a note, what does it say? Is if it's deposited in a Demand deposit account is the equivalent of cash or money. For example, a bank granting of, of, a, of a loan by crediting the proceeds to the customer's demand deposit, that's what they do with that note. They take the promissory note, endorse it, deposit it in a demand deposit account, and write a check to the seller. We just funded the entire loan. You see, I call up a bank and ask them this, and this is what they told me they do. 
Well, I'm not making this up. I got this from the bank. They told me what they did. The investment division of, of Wells Fargo Bank told me this. I had to browbeat him to get him to admit it. But when he knew I knew what I was talking about, he admitted it. This is what they're doing. So all this is cash. Anybody got any questions? Everybody understands what cash is? Okay, go to the title 12. 18, I should put that on the drive too. I'm going to down a little bit. Okay, title 12. The term deposit means the unpaid balance of money or its equivalent. What does that say? Money or its equivalent received or held by a bank or savings association in the usual course of business and for which it is given or is obligated to give credit either conditionally or unconditionally to a commercial checking savings time thrift account or which is evidenced by its certificate of deposit. Don't you do a deposit when you do when you <clears throat> when you put cash, Federal Reserve notes in a bank account or a checking account, you deposit checks, money orders, what have you, into your demand deposit account, it becomes the equivalent of money or cash. A check drawn against a, a, a deposit account is certified by the bank or savings association, or a letter of credit, or a traveler's check on which the bank or savings association is primarily liable, provided that without limiting the generality of the term money or its equivalent, any such account or instrument. Now notice it says account or instrument must be regarded as evidencing the receipt of the equivalent of money when credited or issued in exchange for checks or drafts or for promissory notes. So when you put a promissory note in a demand deposit account, it becomes the equivalent of money or cash. That's what these banks are doing. You're funding, you're the, the, the loan, that's why they won't show you the balance sheet. 2046 balance sheet because it, it will show that the payables and the receivables are zeroed out, which means that you don't owe any money to the bank at all. So what are they billing you for? They're billing you for the tax. The tax, are you getting this? When they send you a bill, what is a bill? It's a tax bill. For what? for the amount of the credit that they use, which has to be reported to the IRS as a return. A return of what? Of interest back to the principal. That's how you get your money back. For the use of your credit is by filing a return and assessing the tax. And if you don't do it, it's not going to get done because it's your credit. What happens when we do this and we get a frivolous like everybody? You show me anybody that's done what I what I've said and has got a frivolous one. You can't even show me anybody that even knows this. <laughs> you should show me anybody that's ever heard of this. If they're doing it, then they're testing you to see if you know what you're doing. What would you do in that? What, would, what course of action would you take? Well, then I would, I, I, I would, uh, I would do a, uh, I would take the bill, take the bill, say deposit, pay to the order of the U.S. Department of Treasury. Just they're sending you a bill, aren't they? Right. Well, so you pay to the order of U.S. Department of Treasury. Charge the sum said to the Internal Revenue Service. Remember, the Internal Revenue Service is, is a trading company. It's privately owned. They have a DUNS number. 
Bottom line, if you don't believe me, go up on the internet and type in there and you can pull up their Dunn's number. Or call the Dunn and Brassfield and ask them. I can get the Dunn's number of anybody. If they send you a letter saying, you know, a frivolous filing thing, are they send you a, you a bill along with that? Or they just send you a letter saying... Sure, they send you a bill, then they? Well, well they're about on it. That's a lien also. That's how much money. See, you're taking this as money that you owe to the IRS. Instead of taking it and doing a pay to the order of it, and sending it back to the IRS, and charge the sum said to the Internal Revenue Service. Do, a, got, do an OID. They're using... Your credit. Well, maybe they're seeing if you know what the hell you're doing. Did you ever stop to think of that? You immediately assume that what you're doing is frivolous. So how do you move forward once you get to bill? What do you do when anybody sends you a bill? Does it make any difference who it is? Okay, but once you get to what should you do? Forget the frivolous. They sent you a bill. Pay to the order of U.S. Department of Treasury. Charge the sum said to the Internal Revenue Service. Um, so it depends on what stage of frivolous is that. Some, some will say we may charge you a frivolous time to get five thousand dollars. Right. They sent you a bill. It doesn't matter whether it's a coupon or not. If they sent you a bill, that bill represents... See, you, you take it and apply it to certain situations, but you don't apply it to everything. It applies to everything. Send me a, send me a, Anybody so sends you a bill, I don't care who it is. Asking for that. If an alien, somebody from an alien planet sends you a bill, they're using your credit. So you're confident about it, so you're not going to be uh, scared off. I would imagine if you sent that the IRS an OID naming them as the recipient of the funds, well, <laughs> they would actually, actually think you know what you're doing. If, if, <laughs> well, uh, is that the proper way you, if you were going to test somebody? Isn't that what you do? Yeah, I would think so. What does everybody do? They go into fandom mania. Hey, were you telling me earlier that we need to send our OIDs to a specific address? Yeah, go to, go to publication 1212. <clears throat> Anybody got any questions about what we've covered so far? I'll type them and I can give it to you. Okay. Okay, scroll down here. It's okay. Scroll down. Okay. You immediately assume that it's a frivolous filing. So what do you do, though? Yeah, but it might be frivolous if we don't know what the hell are doing, what we're doing. They yes. might be right. So you get that letter, okay? Meaning that they're not accepting. Your well, they're filing. sending you whether it's frivolous or not. That's not relevant. Okay. They're sending you a bill, yeah. aren't they? Okay. No, they're not. They're just sending you a letter saying that. Yeah, but when they say, they send her a bill. I don't care what it, if, if there's an amount on that, it's a bill. The frivolous is not a bill. The frivolous is a letter. So it's the meaning of the bill. It's okay. Uh, so it was, it, was, it was basically saying um, there was, a, there was, was an, uh, incorrect, uh, this is what there, there was an address on here. It's on a constitutional address. Hold on, let me do a second. Yeah. I think it was on the 12, the publication 12, 12. Constitution. Be sure to report errors in the omissions of listing writers with the following address. Well, I IRS OID publication project. project. Um, You can email us at tax form. The asterisk must be included in the address. You can write to 
address at the following address. Yeah, Gene, we have the same question we were talking about during the break. How do we keep our electricity on while we're doing the remedy? And you're, you were saying write the normal check as we would and then get it all back at the end of the year, right? Yes. Either that or you send it to the chief financial officer. All these chief financial officers know what's going on. These people that sit behind desks and sort mail you don't have a clue about what you're doing. But the chief financial officer does. Call up the utility company. Now listen to this so you get it right. Call up, the, I've, I've already done this. Call up the, the utility company and find out who their chief financial officer is. Send the coupon to the chief financial officer and you'll get your remedy. They know what's going on. Everybody in the company is just paper, paper shuffers. Just like most of these tax collectors that work for the Internal Revenue Service, they don't know any of the tax laws. All they're doing, they have a bunch of attorneys sitting in the background that know what's going on. They know what I know. Oh, do you want to show them where the CUSIP numbers are for filling out the 8281? You showed me that the other day. I have it right here. I think I was just reminded. Yeah, it's right here, isn't it? What page is that? It's that's page three. three. This is on publication 1212. No, that's not it. Hold on, hold on. No, you're going to have to scroll. This is, wait, what page is that on? Okay, I'll go back. Hold on, hold on. That's on page 7. Okay, 12, 12. it's on page 7. I'm going to show you guys something. Nobody reads anything. Okay, so we go into here. This will take you directly into the IRS website. Okay, here's the OID table. They give you the CUSIP number. This is in PDF or text format. Click on it. These are all, there's 119 pages here. Oops. Keep nervous and nerky. These are the issuers. These are public debt issuers. Here is the CUSEP number. This is the date it was issued and the maturity date. This is issue price, percent of principal amount, annual stated interest, total OID to 1109. And these are millions, 877 million. These people are getting rich, rich off of you. Because you because the American people don't want any responsibility. You gotta have responsibility. Those numbers are millions? Yeah, those are, those are millions. What do you think, that's $71.14? <laughs> this is your CUSEP number. This is the issue date. This is the maturity date. Here's the issue price, annual stated interest. Look at all these companies. Everybody's listed in here. Citicorp is in here, Bank of America, Countrywide, all of them are in here. Deutsche Bank. Deutsche Bank. You have by operation of law, if you li listen to, uh, uh, what is that guy uh, that has that website? Uh, you said you're the one who sent me the I know, video. I don't remember his name. He's an attorney. This guy's an attorney. He says at closing, 
you, by operation of law, you have subrogated yourself to the investors. You have a right to, to a return of all of this money that they've made off of you. How do you get the OID amounts that you would be OIDing on a court? How do you know what they're doing? Could you, could you do a FOIA on that? Ask them if they have a bond in place and how much the, the, the amount of the bond is and ask them if your name is on the bond. Ask them if they posted a bond. The first thing you want to ask them is, did you file a 1099 OID? And they're going to say, what do you mean? Let's just say we're in, let's just go through a little scenario right here. We're in court and I'll be the judge. What are you talking about, sir? I'm talking about a tax issue. That's all we're going to talk about. This, this is isn't a tax issue. issue. This is a court of law. Yes, it is a tax issue. Have you filed the 1099 OID? I don't know what you're talking about. Call up the IRS. They will explain to you what a 1099 OID is. Am I I can only imagine the judge would just play stupid and keep going with you and say, why would I be required to file a 1099 OID? Well, to put a charge on the, on the indictment. Only a creditor can put a charge on the indictment. A debtor cannot charge. Why do you think there's no charge on any of these indictments? That's why there's no grand jury involved in it. See, rubber stamp, every indictment or information or complaint is rubber stamped. Guarantee you. They can't put a charge on it because it's commercial. The only person that can charge it is you because it's your credit they're using. This is a tax issue, not a criminal charge. They, they're charging you to see if you know what you're doing. How many people are in prison, sitting in prison right now? Mm -hmm. Doesn't that prove that I'm right? How many, how many people we got? 30 million people in prison? More than any other, most of the nations combined, I think. That's why people end up in jail, because it's a tax charge. But the problem is, in a court situation, this judge is going to do a dance, and they're just going to, they're going to, they're going to steamroll. You saw, you show me anybody who's done it properly, and they steamroll. I can show, Sam Davis went in there, did an acceptance for value, they dismissed a 244-count uh, indictment. I'm not going to enter a plea. He told me he wasn't going to enter a plea. I don't, I don't have his paperwork or anything, but I know somebody that knows him. And he learned all this stuff from, from, from a conversation between Dave DeRaymer and Roger Elphick and mine. It was published on the internet 20 years ago. And he went out there and started using this stuff, and he's been winning cases. Well, they got a 244-count indictment this time. So he's in federal criminal court. Federal criminal court. And the so judge asked, how do you plead, sir? And he, and he told the judge, he says, I'm not here to enter a plea. And, 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 they wouldn't have done that if it wasn't true. That proves right there it's a tax issue. They recognized him as a creditor because he didn't get in there and argue. He didn't argue. He, 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 he said, I'm not here to enter a plea. I'm here to settle and close this thing. That's what everybody should be doing. You should settle and close it. Why? Because he's making a presentment. And, and if you dishonor him, dishonor the presentment, they go to, they go to collection. And you become the collateral for the tax because you didn't file the tax return. And you have the responsibility. This is what the judge is doing. He's testing you to see if you know what you're doing. And everybody's flunking the test. And if the judge entered a plea form, what would he have done? Well, the judge didn't enter a plea, did he? What if you got run over by a Mack truck and you wouldn't have to worry about it? <laughs> The unforeseen does not exist. Quit putting up roadblocks. No, Everybody no, puts up a what if, what if this? What no, if I no, what no, if I question because in another scenario the judge would. Yeah, the other scenario the judge might do it because he may not know. Yeah. 
So then what's our all these judges know what's going on? All of them. What part of all don't you understand? You mean they don't know that, that they're trading all this commercial paper and using your account to, to do option contracts and they don't know what's going on? Give me, don't insult my intelligence. <laughs> Jesus. I told this one judge, I said, you want me to act as stupid as you are? I said, you missed your calling. I said, you ought to go to the Screen Actors Guild and become an actor. I said, nobody could be that stupid. I said, you're not acting. I said, you're stupid. I told Peter, right? He said, you can't talk to me like that. <laughs> but you're not suggesting that to the students, I'm assuming. No. <laughs> this is, but this is before I knew what was going on, I did that. So what we're trying to ascertain here, Chris is trying to get this, is we're trying to get an amount on, let's just say there's an indictment, a court case, whatever. What amount are we going to OID them for the court case? For that court case itself. Okay, let me, figure let, this out? okay let me go, go, go to publication 950. talking about the exclusion, right? Yeah, go down here. Go down this page. Okay. We're in 2009 or 2010. For, for, for estate tax purposes, you have a $3,500,000 applicable exclusion. That means that you have to make over three million five hundred thousand dollars. Is there anybody that's listening to me that that can claim that they made over three million five hundred thousand dollars? No. Then how the hell can you owe any taxes? No, no, we're talking about for the court cases. When well, we're IDing them. Uh, this, you're not listening. Okay. Listen. I'm trying. Listen. Clear your mind out of all this garbage you got this up, up there. This morning. <laughs> This is an exclusion. That's money sitting there that you're not claiming. You have a unified tax credit of one million four hundred fifty-five thousand eight hundred. In answer to Chris's, I would put both these amounts down. I would put a three million, add these two together, and you'll get. Four, what is that? Three and a half million. How much is that? That's four, four point nine five five. Okay, you got almost five million. Then on the gift side, you have one million dollar exclusion. That's money. That's a deduction. Exclusion is money. Uh, corporations use this as money because you're not using it. Unified tax credit. You have a three three hundred forty-five thousand eight hundred dollar exclusion. This is on the gift side and a one million dollar exclusion amount. Now I'm going to show you something. Here's the form if you want to use the gift and estate tax class five, which is what everything is. If you want documentation of that? Type in IDRS ADP. This is for those of you who weren't in on the earlier classes. This is a 613-page manual. This used to be called the 62090 IDR. I mean, IDRS means Integrated Data Retrieval System. ADP means Automated Data Processing. This is the new one that came out in 2010. This re replaced the 62090 coding manual. You need to read this. Was it page 33? Uh, uh, I really haven't had a chance to look at this. Just one south on this.
Okay, it says here, W-2, wage and tax statement. Here's the tax class, class 5, which is a gift and estate tax. Now, we're going to go down to 1099. Okay, here's the 1099A. A, B, C, capital, dividends, G, government payments, interest income, OID, original issue discount, is what? Five. What is five? A class five gift and a state tax. It used to be in part two, I think. Or on page 74 of the old one. Here it is. Right here. here it is. Okay, it's 4 9. All they did was change the name. They shortened up the. See, see what it says here? A class one is withholding and social security. Class two is individual income tax. This is in part 4 9, page 4 9 of this manual. Processing manual. IRS processing manual. Class 5 is estate and gift taxes. So all W-2s, W-4s, 1098s, 1099s, and 1096s are all Class 5 gift and estate taxes. I didn't write this manual. The IRS did. If you think they don't know this, you're going to be in for a rude awakening to do. You need to study this. Download it and read it. This is 613 pages. We could spend a month on this. <laughs> I've read the thing about four or five times. You need to read this. This tells you what they're really doing. Not what you think they're doing. Okay, now let's go to the IRS website. www.irs.gov Forms and Publications Go to uh, 709 Find Form 709 Okay, this is the gift tax United States gift tax return and generates a skipping transfer that's a taxable termination. This is what you should be filing on your mortgages. Because they're doing, when they do a foreclosure, it's a taxable termination. Scroll down here. Remember in publication 950? Line 7. Minimum, maximum unified credit. You got a $345,800 credit. Unified credit. You have to get a make, you, the mortgage has to be more than that in order to have a tax liability. Then you can use your unified tax credit, which is $3,500,000 as an estate. Then you can file a 706. Nobody files these kinds of returns because they don't know about this stuff. Because they don't read anything. You have to read. That's how I found it out, by reading. Now let's go to 706. I'll show you what the difference is. And generation skipping transfer? You know what a generation skipping transfer is? No. Well, Taxable defined as a taxable termination. Yeah, a, 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 a transfer, a direct or indirect skip. This is the 706. 
The United States of State and Generation Skipping Transfer Tax Return. Form 7006. You can dial these. We are getting these forms off of the IRS website. This has an instruction manual with it. Read the instruction manual. A, a state of every citizen or resident of the United States. I'll guarantee you that there isn't anybody filing these. And this is what you should be filing. To be filed for decedent dying after December 31st, 2008. You were dead at the day you were born. They filed a death certificate. Nobody's using this because they don't understand gifts in a state tax law. Go to Title 26 and I'll show you. What it was. Okay, this is what a generation skipping transfer is. You saw it was on 25, on Form 709 and Form 706. For purposes, this is Section 2611 of Title 26. A generation skipping transfer is defined as one, a taxable distribution, a taxable termination, and a direct skip. 2612. These are capital transfer taxes, which is what they're doing. They're, whose capital are they transferring? Yours, because you're not claiming it. Now, who's liable for these taxes? Now we're going to go to 2603. Liability for tax. Taxable distribution. In the case of a taxable distribution, the tax imposed by Section 2601 shall be paid by the transfer E. That's the person that is transferred to. That's who the transferer transfers to the transfer E. Taxable termination. In the case of a taxable termination or a direct skip from a trust, the tax shall be paid by the trustee. When they terminate your interest in the property at a foreclosure, isn't that a taxable termination? Who has to pay it? So we tell trustee. Them. Who's the trustee? What they're doing is billing you for the taxable termination on the foreclosure. They're not billing you for the mortgage. Jesus. So if they foreclose and we can send them a 1099, send yeah. a trustee company a 1099, the one that forecloses on us. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Direct skip. In the case of a direct skip, the tax shall be paid by the transfer earth, which is a direct skip. Okay, let's go to 2612. Okay, what is a taxable termination? This is 20, 20, Title 26, Section 2612. For purposes of this chapter, the term taxable termination means the termination by death, lapse of time, 
release of power or otherwise of an interest in property held in trust. Isn't that what you're doing at closing? Doesn't it say in your deed of trust that you're transferring all right title and interest in the below described property to the lender? Isn't that a taxable termination at closing? And who's liable for the tax? The trustee is. Why are you paying their taxes? That's what the foreclosure is. It's the tax, capital transfer tax, on the taxable termination that was done by the court when they foreclosed on the property or was done by the trustee at closing. And these non-judicial foreclosures, the trustee is the one that forecloses on the property. It's a taxable termination. You've terminated your interest in it, and they're billing you for the tax because you didn't claim it. Well, along those, lines, property. along those lines, Gene, then when you transfer, the, when you hand them the note and the deed of trust, you're transferring property, right? Yeah, but they're the trustee. They're the trustee. Yeah, yeah it is. Right. Okay. If you want, if you don't, you will. Give it to him, with him. Let's go to 2613. Okay, remember it says a direct skip or indirect skip? Mm -hmm. A skip person is a trust. A non-skip person is a non-trust. Scroll down. So, the so if the trust, under this then, if the trust transfers property as a skip person, the transferor is liable for the tax again, right? Yeah. It. Means any person who is not a skip person. Where, where'd you go? Right. <laughs> skip person means any person who is not a skip person. What is a skip person? A trust. So anything that's a non trust is a non skip person. It's a non trust. What is, what is the definition of a person? Individual, corporation, trust, association, company, or estate is a person. An artificial, it's a deceit. I'll save you the research. It's a deceit, dead person. That's why all these tax statutes on gift and estate taxes refer to a deceit, a dead person. Now let's go to. 2652. Can you explain what a skip person is? I know it says a person assigned to... It's a trust. Number two. It can also be a natural person assigned to a generation which is two or more generations below the generation assignment of the transfer of earth. Isn't it assigned to a generation? Yeah. Well, generation means uh, you can be two generations or one generation, which is two or more generations below the generation assignment of the transfer of That means, you know what a generation means? Races. Which is a trust, or a trust. Okay, but what do you mean assigned to a generation? Which is two or more generations below the generation assignment of the transfer of well, the, uh, if the transferor is a generation, then it's two or more generations below that to the person that transfers it. The generation means a lifespan. If you're talking about a natural person, but it also says it's a trust. It's a trust, which is not a natural person. Twenty-six fifty-two. Any case of any property subject to the tax posed by Chapter Twelve, the donor, that's the transfer of earth.
Scroll down. Okay, it tells you what a trust is. The term trust includes any arrangement. This is 2652 of Title 26, subsection B1, definition of a trust. The term trust includes any arrangement which, although not a trust, has substantially the same effect as a trust. So any arrangement that has the effect of a trust is a trust, whether it's called a trust or not. Read the next one. Read the next one. Okay. Okay. Trustee. In the case of an arrangement which is not a trust, but which is treated as a trust under this subsection, the term trustee shall mean the person in actual or constructive possession of the property subject to such arrangement. This is the judge. In all these foreclosure cases, isn't the judge acting as a trustee? Is anybody getting this? The judge is acting, he has actual constructive custody. If you think these people don't know what they're doing, you, you're going to be in for a rude awakening. And the only people that don't know what they're doing are the American people. All these judges know this. That's why they ran out of the courtroom when I did a trust on them. They ran out of the courtroom, shut the court down, and, and dismissed the case. Does that prove that it's a tax issue? Because what I did is I made them liable for all the taxes. And they had to drop the claim or pay the taxes. So they dismissed it. This defines a trustee. This defines a trust. Okay, now we're going to go back to... Anybody got any questions? Mm -hmm. Not yet. Okay, let's go back to... Uh, Executor. The term executor. This is 2203 of Title 26. Definition of executor. The term executor, wherever it is used in this title in connection with the estate tax imposed by this chapter, means the executor or administrator of the decedent. Who is the decedent? The all capital letter name. Who you call a straw man. Or if there is no executor or administrator appointed, qualified, and acting within the United States, then any person in actual or constructive possession of any property of the decedent. Every time you go into court, the judge is acting as an executor of the estate. You just don't know it. That's what this says. Does he have actual or constructive custody of your estate? You're in his courtroom. The all capital letter name is a legal estate. Does he have constructive custody of it? You're damn right he does. Now go to 22, go to previous, the previous. Appeal, go to 2201. Or excuse me, I'm, I'm, I'm mixing it. Uh, I want to go to 2002, back in 2002. Who's liable for the tax on an estate? The tax imposed by this chapter shall be paid by the what? The executor. Who's the executor? The person who has actual and constructive custody of the estate property. Who has actual or constructive uh, custody of the estate property? The judge does. Because you're in his courtroom. Now 
three is liable. We've got to change the tape, then we'll be right back.
go. Yeah. Okay, anybody that wants all of these, there's about 50 sections there. Go all the way down to the bottom. This goes clear down to, uh, go down to the bottom. Yeah, that's it. 12454. Anybody that wants it for a $25 donation, I'll download all these and send them to you. There's about 50 sections on OID. You wonder why people don't know what OID is. This explains the whole thing. We're going to go into this section right here, 2405. You can study these on your own. So you can be ready when the men in black knock on your door? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Variable rate debt instrument. For a debt instrument to be a variable rate instrument, the instrument's issue price can exceed the total non-contingent principal payments by more than a certain amount. It must provide for stated interest. It must provide that a qualified floating rate or ob objective rate in effect at any time during the term of the instrument is set at a current value of the rate, and it must not provide for any contingent payments of principal. But a debt instrument, other than a tax exempt obligation, isn't a variable rate instrument if 1274, Internal Revenue Code Section 1274 applies to the instrument, any stated interest payment on the instrument are treated as a contingent payments under 1242623. A debt instrument that provides for a variable rate of interest but that doesn't qualify as a variable rate debt instrument is a contingent payment debt instrument. Contingent means uh, contingent on other factors outside the instrument. Now we're going to go to 124.06. Modification of debt instrument. This is what they're doing at closing on these mortgages. For purposes of IRC 1272, requiring current inclusion of income of OIDC 2401, IRSC 1273, governing determination of amount of includable OID. If the terms of a debt instrument are modified to defer one or more payments and the modification doesn't cause an exchange under 1001 to 10550, 150 XFC. The debt instrument is treated as retired and then reissued on the date of modification for an amount equal to the instrument adjusted, adjusted issue price. Oh, sorry. Okay, now I'm going to show you something. Here's what they're doing on these mortgages. Go back out of here. Where? Go back to my folder where that folder is. Okay. Oh, no. Okay, go over right here. Uh, let's see. Uh, scroll down. Scroll down. Keep going. Okay. Keep going. Click on here, explanation of the OID. Yeah, right 
not articulate. Go back down. Maybe I didn't put it on here. Go, go back to the top. Click on 1099 OID. Uh, scroll down. This explains uh, the uh, gone. Okay. Scroll down. Okay, click on here, get considered publicly traded. Yep, this is it. <clears throat> okay, this, this is this explains, move, move this over. This is the one I was reading to you. That's Everybody it. who's got a mortgage should read this. We'll, put, we'll load, anybody that sends a donation of $25, we'll load all this stuff on there and we'll, and we'll give it to you so you can study it. Is your debt considered publicly traded? This is an accounting firm. Companies contemplating a debt restructuring should assess the potential tax implications. When a company restructures or modifies an existing debt instrument, one of the questions that must be answered in determining the con consequent tax result is whether the debt instrument is traded on an established market, i.e. publicly traded. Further, the definition of publicly traded is much broader than most companies realize and is not limited to debt that most investors, dealers, and brokers may consider publicly traded. Anytime you give somebody a debt instrument, you're giving them a public traded debt instrument. Through the recent enactment of Section 108, and you should read this, this is Section 108I of Title 26, allows electing debtor companies to alle alleviate much of the federal tax income impact of such a determination. The potential state tax consequences to the debtor company and overall tax consequences to the debtor remain significant. This bulletin will help you understand and navigate the rules to determine whether your debt is publicly traded. Now here's the, quen the clincher. If a modification, when they securitize your note, that's a loan modification. If a modification of a debt instrument is significant, the debt, the old debt, is deemed satisfied and reissued new debt by the company. In determining the impact on the company from the deemed exchange, the old debt is deemed satisfied by an amount equal to the new debt's issue price. This is what they're doing on these mortgages. To the extent that if the issue price on the new debt is less than the principal amount of the old debt, cancellation of the debt, COD, will occur. The determination of the issue price of the new debt hinges upon whether the debt is publicly traded. If the debt is not publicly traded, a safe harbor of convenience provides that the new debt's issue price is generally equal to the principal amount of the debt. As a result, cancellation of debt is generally avoided on non-publicly traded debt. On the other hand, the, the issue price on debt that is considered publicly traded is equal to its fair market value. With most debt currently trading well below the stated principal amounts, a company is likely to incur cancellation of debt income on a deemed exchange of publicly traded debt. That's what they're doing with your loans. The debt is canceled when they modify it. When they modify the debt instrument, which is your note, and convert it to a security, it is a security, if it has maturity of more than nine months, 
That's Title 15, Section 78, CDA 10. Go read it. The modified the debt instrument. That cancels the old debt. Now you have a new debt. The old debt is canceled. That's what this says. This is written by an accounting firm, one of the biggest accounting firms in the United States. This is what they're doing because you're not claiming the tax. You're not assessing the tax on the on the debt instrument, which is your promissory note and the deed of trust. Both the promissory note and the deed of trust are debt instruments. They're evidence of indebtedness. Isn't that what a trustee on a non-judicial foreclosure in California? They're foreclosing on the deed of trust, which is a debt, debt instrument. It's evidence of indebtedness. It's, it evidences the mortgage. The debt obligation is evidenced by the note. The mortgage is evidenced by the deed of trust. When they sell the note, they sold the deed of trust. When they sold the deed of trust, the debt is canceled. You should do a 1099-C, evidencing the, the, the cancellation of the debt. That's why they're foreclosing on all your properties, because you're not following the correct paperwork. Let's go back to, uh, to 124.05 we're at. <laughs> We're on five million six. Yeah, twenty four oh six. Modification of debt in instrument that defers payment for purposes of of the Internal Revenue Code twelve seventy two, requiring current inclusion in income of C OIDC. 124.01 and Internal Revenue Code 1273 governing determination of amount of includable OID. OID includable is debt instruments. The term of a debt instrument are modified to defer one or more payments and the modification doesn't cost an, an exchange under 1001 to 100. 50, that debt instrument is treated as retired and then reissued on the date of the modification for an amount equal to the instrument's suggested issue price on the date. So what they did on your loan is they re retired the old debt instrument on the date of the modification. When they securitized the note, they did a modification, which which created a new debt, which you're not liable for. One twenty-four oh seven. Debt instrument subject to current inclusion of OID rule. The OID Current inclusion rules under Section 12401 apply to all debt instruments issued with OID other than these. All, are you getting this? All debt instruments. And what are all debt instruments? Any evidence of indebtedness, checks, notes, Debenture certificates of deposit. We went over those in section 61, title 26. Anything that's a debt instrument, all commercial paper is debt instruments, and they're includable in gross income because they're evidence of indebtedness. If somebody owes somebody money, isn't that evidence of indebtedness? It doesn't. Title 26, Section 61, say that's includable in gross income? Yes. So why aren't you including it in gross income? Debt instruments, other than corporate debt. Well, here's, uh, you got tax exempt obligations, U.S. savings bonds. These are excluded. 
Even I put it in there. This says debt instruments other than corporate debt instruments issued before July 2nd, 1982. Corporate debt estimates issued before May 28, 69. The IRS issues a list of publicly traded obligations for which current inclusion of OID is required. That's 37. That's that. Uh, oh, publication 1212. Yeah. yeah, there's publication 1212, which we just went over. One twenty four oh eight original issue discount is defined. OID is the excess, if any, of the obligation's stated redemption price at maturity over its issue price. But OID is treated as zero if the excess is less than one quarter of one percent, or 0.25 percent of the stated redemption price at maturity multiplied by the number of complete years to maturity. They're taking all, all these banks are doing that. They're taking your checks, your canceled checks, and, and trading them. Because you're not reporting them as income. So that, that you get the return of the income for the use of your credit. Can you get more simpler than that? Every check that you write, you should be including this as a debt instrument, publicly traded. These banks are trading your checks. Well, you can do it. If you do it, I think if you do it with the chief financial officer, you're not going to run into any problems. You remember, you're dealing with people. You know, you're dealing with people. 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 You're dealing with you got to deal with what is. You can do it that way. You can do it and or either way. Is that what you're Well, I think if you do it right, I've, I've never had my stuff shut off. Ever. I've done some of the stuff, but I've been so busy, I'm so busy teaching and helping other people that I haven't had time to, to do all this stuff. Mm -hmm. The process doesn't mean I don't believe in it. It means I just, I, I'm just trying to help. Karen, I'm trying to help uh, there's a bunch of people that are that have gotten themselves in trouble because they don't understand this stuff. So that's why I'm teaching it. So everybody can understand that way I don't have to get involved in everybody's problems. The reason I'm teaching it. So all debt instruments are OID. spend a whole day, day on this. Uh, okay, here's 124.09. Stated redemption price at maturity defined. For OID purposes, 124.08, a debt instrument stated redemption price at maturity is the amount fixed by the last modification of the purchase agreement. Includes interest and other amounts payable at the time, but not interest is based on a fixed rate, and that's payable unconditionally at fixed periodic intervals of one year or less during the entire term of the. So what they did is they modified the conditions of payment. 
You can't do that. That's a no-no. That extinguishes, that discharges the drawer and the maker. You cannot modify a negotiable instrument. Go read 3-106D. It has to be, what does this say? It says right here, that's payable unconditionally. That's one of the conditions of a negotiable instrument. It has to be an unconditional promise to pay. It cannot be governed by uh, other instruments in the loan, which is what they're doing. They're governing them by the deed of trust and the adjustable rate rider, or the fixed rate rider, if it's a fixed mortgage. This is what they're doing. They're modifying the condition, and nobody's picking up on this because they're, they're, they don't read the Uniform Commercial Code. Stated redemption price at maturity. They're modifying the conditions of your debt instrument. And when they do that, that discharges your loan. That's what securitization is. Let's go to 124.10. Stated redemption price, this is section 124.10, stated redemption price at maturity for obligation issued as part of an investment unit. If an obligation is issued as part of an investment unit that includes an option, security, or other property, is that what they're doing on these mortgages? They're signing investment contracts. They're selling them as an investment. The obligation of stated redemption party is for OID purposes, the amount payable on maturity in respect of the obligation. It doesn't include any amount payable in respect of the option, security, or other property under a repurchase agreement. That's why you should claim the value of the note at maturity. And you do that by multiplying the amount of your payments by 30. If you have $345,000 or $300,000 mortgage and your payments are $3,000 a month, you multiply 30 times 3000 So OID, like, what OID is redemption price minus the issue price? No, redemption, the, the it, 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 original issue discount is the value of the, of the uh, when it's sold at discount, before it matures. That's the original issue discount, that's why they call it the discount selling it at a discount before it reaches maturity. If it waits until maturity, then it's, the value of it is, is 30 times whatever payments you're making. What, what are your mortgage payments on your house? Uh, I'm not paying mortgage payments. Well, what, what is, how much were your payments? $5,300. Okay, for 30 years, right? Yeah. What's 30 times 5,300? A lot. Okay, that's the no, value. 360 times 5,300. Okay, well, what, what is it? You're, you're talking about that's what they owe you as the issuer of the discount. You issued it. I don't care what the IRS says. If you do this thing right, you know what this is? If I'm, if, uh, it's not if I'm right, I am right. I've proven it. Doesn't this say everything I'm saying it says? If I'm right, then all, they owe you all this money. All you got to do is claim it. Multiply 30 years times whatever your monthly payments are. All these mortgages are different. And that's how much money they owe you. Since the the investors, we should be you should be going after the investors. Ask your servicing company. You're going after the wrong people. You shouldn't be going after the servicing company. Right. We should be OIDing the trust. Uh, the, the, the indenture trustee. Yeah. The they're they're trustee. the holder. Yeah. Right. You should be going after the indenture trustee, who's making the, your payments, monthly payments to the to the investors.
You should be going after the investor. Why? Because they because it, you're the one that gave the original issue discount to the investor. And they're they're making all this money off of it and they're not paying you anything. That's unjust enrichment. This is what all this is saying. What do you think? You think I'm building a case? Mm -hmm. Huh? This is section 124.11, qualified state interest defined for OID purposes. Section 124.08, qualified stated interest is stated interest that is unconditionally payable in cash or in property other than debt instruments of the issuer or will be constructively received under 451 at least annually at a sixth rate. Interest is unconditionally payable only if reasonable legal remedies exist to compel timely payments or the debt instrument otherwise provides terms and conditions to make it at the likelihood of late payment not within a reasonable grace period or non-payment a remote contingency. Are you getting the... Does everybody understand how complex this is? Now you know why nobody understands OID, original issue discount. It applies to all debt instruments, whether they're publicly traded or non-publicly traded. And this, when we get down here farther, uh, we we got to go clear to uh, how much more time have we got? 30 minutes. How much? 30. we got 30 minutes. Do you want me to, uh, let's put it to a vote. Do you want me to get into the declaration of trust? Or do you want me to continue with this? They can input while we go over. While we go over the next one real quick. I vote for the declaration of trust. So I'd like to see that. I haven't seen it. 2412. Stated interest in OID on a variable rate debt estimate that provides for annual payments of interest at a single variable rate. These are variable rates. That's why your mortgage ends up in foreclosure. Because the interest, because of the London index, the variable, the rate interest, they're using the London index, the Treasury Department is, and the interest rate goes up. And it changes the principle. That's why you're, am I right? Mm -hmm. uh, okay. Uh, this is what this is, this is telling you what they're doing. Let's touch on the declaration real quick if we can. Okay, uh, we're going to go to, uh, go back to my folder. We're going to, you can see this, there's 50, go down here. Let's go clear up to 54. 1254. In fact, it goes into this. Here's the reference on this. But I said I'll download all of these and send them. If anybody makes a $25 donation, I'll give you the whole, every one of those, and you can study them on your own home if you want to do it. Okay, go to the, uh, let's see. Click on 1099 OID. For the Declaration of Trust? Go to, uh, uh, yeah, scroll down. It's a, it's a PDF file. It should be a PDF file. Uh, let's see. Here it is. Asher Trust? Yeah. Okay, we should go to the, to, to the letter rogatory first before we do that. Find it the letter rogatory. Scroll down here. Scroll down. It's not here. I saw it at the bottom. Okay. Okay. Let's oh, it's out. It's outside of here. 
Wait, wait, is it in here? Because I saw a letter over for the lines. Yeah, it might be in here. So, yeah, here it is. This, this is, uh, can you reduce that down? It's too big. Yeah, it's too big. And this is still, uh, well, okay. And, and look. Uh, move, move it over. Don't want to move it over. Okay, this is an actual case, criminal case, fourth degree felony, that I was involved in. He threw the case up. The judges ran out of the courtroom, hired attorneys, and dismissed the case. I, was first, I did all this paperwork. This is a Superior Court case in Pomona, California. Jack P. Hunt was with the judge involved. Dear Judge Hunt, I am writing this letter of rogatory or request as the donor, grantor, beneficiary of the complex trust account number. This is the registered mail number. We, used, we took the registered mail number off of the certified mailing and used that as the trust account number, of which you have been appointed a fiduciary trustee pursuant to Title 28, Section 1781, and Federal Rules of Civil Procedure 28B on the Convention on the Taking of Evidence in a Civil or Commercial Matters under Chapter 1, Article 1, to notice you that a taxable event has occurred in Case Number KA078869 on the trade receivables and payables on Account Number by the recent conversion, this is the account number, this is the case number. By the recent conversion sale and transfer under the Miller Reinsurance Agreement in favor of the United States through Standard Forms 275, the Performance Bond 273, and the Payment Bond 274 by the United States Attorney under Title 28, Sections 2041 to 2042 to asset and commercial backed securities. Since I am not assuming the tax liability for this conversion, transfer, and sale as a taxable event, I'm requesting that you order the district or prosecuting attorney to send me certified copies of the U.S. Informational Tax Forms 1096 and the accompanying 1099 OIDs and Tax Forms 8300 for any cash payments over $10,000. Remember, any cash payments over $10,000 are reportable. Remember what cash is? FASB number 95. A promissory note is a cash payment if it's, if it's deposited in a demand deposit account for a loan. It's the equivalent of money or cash. And any tax forms, 8300 for any cash payments over $10,000. The 1099 OIDs will identify who the payor is and the recipient of the funds or cash proceeds accounting standards, statement of, uh, statement of financial accounting standards, number 95, and the IAS international accounting standards, 7.6, containing the inflows and outflows of cash and cash equivalents on the balance sheet, Federal Reserve Form is Form 2046 from securitization of the off balance sheet receivables. Secure. Securitization off balance sheet receivables. 
Securitization is off-balance sheet financing. And payable, which identify both the source and principal for which the funds or cash proceeds were derived from. That's why they have to file this to reveal where they got the funds from. Since I am the beneficiary and you are the trustee or bailee of the Sestake Trust or Fidei Commissary account, and the trade receivables and payables are the corpus or res of the trust for which you are required to file a return under 26. Title 26, Section 6012A4, as taxable income on a sale from the trust. If I do not receive the requested tax forms within 45 to 60 days of the date of this letter, I will file the above forms with the Internal Revenue Service regarding case K078869 on the trade receivables and payables on account 267861036, showing myself as the payer and you and the U.S. Attorney as the recipient of the cash flow. Proceeds are from from which the conversion, transfer, and sale of the bonds to securities as an off balance sheet item from the Cessnick Trust. Since this case involves a claim under the exclusive jurisdiction of Admiralty Maritime Law by operation of law, under the judicial power of the United States under Article 1, Section 2 of the Constitution of the United States of America, and since I am therefore a ward of Admiralty and Sestake Truston, with their trustees as set forth in Garrett versus Moore McCormick, Inc., 317 U.S. at 247, you have a fiduciary trustee responsibility to me to provide the above requested form. I did a UCC1 establishing Baylor and Bailey relationship. Okay, now I'll go to the Done according to the Uniform Trust Code of 2005, sections 401, 402, tell you how to create a trust. You need to download the Uniform Trust Code of 2005. Holy moly, you send it to everybody. These are all the people that got a copy of this trust. District Attorney, pull down, look at that. Police Department, North Carolina was involved in the transfer of this. District Attorney from North Carolina, Police Department from North Carolina. I did this for this guy here, John Philip Asher, 505 Winding at Ivy Court, Fletcher, North Carolina. Notice, this is notice of creation. This shows intent to create a trust, which is one of the prerequisites for creating a trust under the Uniform Trust Code of 2005. Notice is hereby given that the below entitled complex trust is formed now pursuant to the War Powers Act of March 9, 1933, in Title 26, Section 2652B1. The Trading with the Enemy Act of October 6, 1917, in Title 50, Appendix 7E, those persons shall be held liable in any court for or in respect to anything done or omitted in pursuance of any order, rule, or regulation made by the President under the authority of this Act. In other words, they can't be held liable under the Treaty with the Enemy Act. Why? Because you're an enemy. If you're a U.S. citizen, you're an enemy. Any payment, conveyance, transfer, assignment, or delivery of money or property made to the alien property custodian hereunder shall be a full acquittance and discharge for all purposes of the obligation of the person making the same to the extent of the same. 
I incorporated all, I used the California probate code because they incorporated the Uniform Trust Code into the California probate code. You got what section? It starts with section 15200 and goes to 21,700 exclusive shall be applicable. I even put the provisions of Article 4, 401 and 402 of the Uniform Trust Code of 2005 was amended in Chapter 36C of the North Carolina Uniform Trust Code. Almost all your states except California have adopted the Uniform Trust Code. The Treaty of the Articles of Confederation, Trust of, of November 1st, and in full force as of March 1st, 1781. Title 10 of the Armed Forces under the Uniform Code of Military Justice, 31, 32, 33, and 34. And the Confiscation Acts of August 6, 1861, July 16, 1862, codified at Title 50, Sections 211, 12, 13. The Civil War has never ended. There's proof of it right there. The Confiscation Acts of August 6, 1861 and July 16, 1862 are codified in Title 50, Sections 211, 212, and 213. And they're still in force today. Proof of death. This is Title 31, Section 3128. This is how you get payment. Proof of death. A finding of death made by an, an officer or employee of the United States government authorized by law to make the finding is sufficient proof of death to allow credit in the accounts of a Federal Reserve Bank or accountable official of the Department of the Treasury in a case involving the transfer, exchange, reissue, redemption, or payment of obligations of the government, including obligations guaranteed by the government for which the Secretary of the Treasury acts as transfer agent. Now what is that telling you? What's proof of death? At birth, you were issued a death certificate. The all capital letter name is a decedent or dead person. To allow, that's why you, it's sufficient proof of death to allow credit in the accounts of a Federal Reserve Bank. Read it, what does it say? You wonder why they ran out of the courtroom? And hired that, is that why they give us a Social Security card at birth that we don't really know about? Yeah. They give you the issue of a death certificate. Because the bond number on the back. Well, because you you, you 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 have two birth certificates. You have a death certificate and you have a birth you have a, a birth the birth the, the birth certificate is there's two birth certificates. One birth certificate is the all capital letter name or the deceased. He was born and died on the same day that he was born. The certificate of live birth is the live person, you. A finding of death made by an officer or employee of the United States government authorized by law to make the finding is sufficient proof of death to allow credit in the accounts of a Federal Reserve Bank or accountable official of the Department of Treasury. In a case involving the transfer, exchange, reissue, redemption, or payment of obligations of the government, including obligations guaranteed by the government for which the Secretary of the Treasury acts as transfer agent. Are there any questions about this? Okay, this is the guy I did the trust for. John Philip Asher is donor, grantor, and beneficiary. And a beneficiary of the Organic Treaty of the Articles Confederation Trust of November 1st, 1777. And ratified in force since March 1st, 1781. And of the United States of America and the Organic National Trust of 1849 of California State and being duly sworn to closes the states the following that as a sovereign American by, by the declaration
Declaration of Independence as of for April 26, 2007, and being of sound mind, hereby declare and appoint as fiduciary trustees, administrators, executors, and representatives the following individual persons, trustees, and claimants. Alleged John Doe 1, John Doe 2, the people of the state of California, George W. Bush, Commander-in-Chief of the United States Army, Henry M. Paulson, Secretary of the United States Treasury, John E. Potter, Postmaster General and CEO, Albert Gonzalez, United States Attorney General, Stacy Hilton, Federal Detention Trustee, Arnold Schwarzenegger, Governor of the State of California, Jack B. Hunt, California Superior Court Judge, L.A. County, Thomas C. Falls, California Superior Court Judge, L.A. County, Steve Cooley of Los Angeles County District Attorney, Tambu Usher, Los Angeles County Deputy District Attorney, Jennifer Turpin, Detective, City of Pomona, Police Department, MAG, CSMR, Franklin F. Newman, Provost Marshall, 40th DSB, Deborah Bowen, California Secretary of State, Chief Sammy Jones, Los Angeles County Correctional Trustee, Sheriff Lee Baca, Los Angeles County Sheriff, David Fox, Henderson County, North Carolina, Assistant District Attorney Detective Eric M. Swift, City of Fletcher, North Carolina Police Department, Sandra F. Lauder, Lacker, I guess that is, Henderson County, North Carolina Magistrate, as the signs or agents of the legal estate of the decedent John Philip Asher. <clears throat> so what happened here? I established that he's dead. That's a dead man, a decedent. So what does that do? Authorizes payment, doesn't it? Under Title 31, Section 3128, which I just read to you. Proof of death. This is proof of death. On account number, not pro doc, as of April 26, 2000, 2007, including all incidents, taxable terminations, taxable transfers, distributions, direct skips stemming from, or relating to, as pass-throughs or trusts or having any relationship to or from or within any incident to North Carolina Trust number 07CR052464 in California Trust Code AO078869 City of Florida, California Police Department Trust Case in Los Angeles County, California or in a 9845026 John Asher K-6Y in Los Angeles County Miss Central, <coughs> 41, 441, Boschett Street, Los Angeles, California, or any California County Correctional Facility where the defendant, John Philip Asher, is detained. For, and on behalf of the donor, grantor, beneficiary, John Philip Asher. The lowercase name is the beneficiary, the donor, grantor, beneficiary. These appointments will not be affected by the addition of additional administrators, executives, representatives, claimants, or fiduciary trustees from time to time by the donor, grantor, or beneficiary, John Philip Asher, as they may become known. You do an indenture agreement and bond. This, no this notice and appointment of the above listed administrators, executives, Fiduciary trustees, claimants, and representatives by the grantor, donor, grantor, beneficiary, John Philip Asher is controlled and governed by the following indenture agreement and indemnity bond. All fiduciary trustees are required to post the following performance bonds when the value of the person or property exceeds $100,000. They have to put up a fidelity bond under the person. You've got to put up a fidelity bond to guarantee what? Your fidelity as a fiduciary trustee, your faithfulness. If you don't perform your duties, you forfeit the bond. Breach of fiduciary duty. You need to make these people, they're all trustees administering your estate. Make them do their job. You've got to make them do their job. They're not going to do anything unless you make them.
It, this is the Uniform Trust Code of, of North Carolina. Trustees bond. A trustee should provide bonds and secure the performance of the trustee's duties if the trust instrument was ex executed before January 1st, 2006, unless the terms of the trust instrument provide otherwise. Well, that's what I did. I provided it otherwise. I said, you're going to have to put up a fidelity bond. Because that guarantees that they, they didn't want anything to do with this. In fact, they told him they were going to put him in a mental institution. He didn't tell them who did it. Did he tell him? No, he didn't. <laughs> <laughs> they dismissed the game. Saying, well, I don't want to deal with this. Would you like to deal with this? Yeah, no. If bond is required, it shall be any sum of double the value of the first one. This is a criminal case. Doesn't that tell you that it's a trust? Right? And isn't all this tax law in here? 31 through 3128, Title 26, Section uh, 2613, 2603, 2611, 2612, taxable termination. We haven't even got down there yet. Where are we getting down there? This is all tax law. You're going to do that next week for it. Remember, remember I told you that everything is a right. Do you think they would dismiss a fourth degree felony? This is, you're, you're fucking around with a goddamn traffic case. This is a fourth degree felony. It ran out of the courtroom, went home, shut the court down for three months and dismissed the case. Never took him back to court after this. They went and hired attorneys. And what they do, tell them, they told them, get rid of this. Gene, let's continue this next week because we're three hours and 40 minutes in. Okay, we're going to have to, we're running, uh, we ran out of, out of tape, so we're going to we're going to continue this next week. So come back next week and we'll continue this. I'll show you how to put this thing together. Or if you want me to do one for you, I'll do one for you. For a reasonable fee, I'll put one together for you and show you how this stuff really works. This stuff really works. Guarantee it. Thank you for your continued support. I love you all. Come back next week. Thank you.